first. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to the official thing now. <laughs> Dear David, I'm truly delighted, as I already uh, told you, to be in meet you today. Uh, mm -hmm. We all had a truly brilliant uh, cooperation for our forthcoming uh, volume uh, on symbiotic uh, posthumanist ecologies. So now, as the editor in chief uh, at the Journal of Ecohumanism, I would like to welcome you and warmly thank you for supporting our journal series of uh, online lectures. Professor David Spancy is a distinguished expert on drama studies. His work deals with questions of ontology, immanence, performance, and technology, and their relation to the Anthropocene, or even to the post-Anthropocene, as we are going to see today. So it's a great pleasure to attend your lecture today on such an exciting topic about zero-artistry, a concept that enters into dialogue uh, with Deleuze and Guattari's zero-philosophy. So before uh, all that, I would also like to thank all of you for joining us in this initiative of uh, online lectures and give the floor to Nicoletta uh, to present us a short bio of uh, Professor Fancy. Wonderful. Thank Our cordial you. thanks, uh, David, once again. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Peggy. Thank you very much, Professor Carpuzu. And actually, I have seen that we have scholars from uh, Iraq, from United Kingdom, from India, from uh, um, many countries, uh, from actual Poland. Uh, thank you very much that uh, you have joined us today. Good morning in the United States of America. Good evening, uh, Europe and Asia. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. And welcome in the Journal of Eco Humanism's online lecture series. The Journal of Ecohumanism is an international peer reviewed journal of scholars, researchers, and students who investigate ecohumanist and civil narratives in the fields of environmental humanities, citizen humanities, literary theory, and cultural criticism, enabling short, short accounts of research study cases, articles, book reviews in this interdisciplinary field of humanities. You are welcome to submit actually your work there, as well as to the Environmental Humanities book series, all published by the Transnational Press London, based in the United and Kingdom. Now I will present you Professor Fancy. Dr. Fancy received his doctoral training at the Samuel Beckett Center at Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland, working on questions around the ontology of state's presence and their intersection with postcoloniality in the work of playwright Bernard Marie Coltes and director Patrice Serrault. His research interests and current publishing deals with questions of ontology, immanence and performance, with a specific interest in immanence and performativity, immanence and performance training, and immanence and technology. Fancy has an extensive creative practice as a playwright and director. He has been awarded a Brock uh, Chancellor's Chair for Excellence in Teaching from 2005 until 2008 with Shusbury, as well as Disabilities and Best Practices Teaching Awards. David served as chair of department from 2009 until 2012 and 2020 until 2021. Thank you very much, dear David. Uh, deep gratitude that you have joined us today. And uh, actually, uh, the floor is yours. No, thank you so much. Um, and great thanks to uh, Peggy, Professor Carpuzu, and, and Nicoletta, Dr. Zimpaki, for this uh, warm welcome and for organizing this, and also for the thanks to the Journal of Eco Humanism for the framework. I'd also like just to thank Jan Jagodinsky and Paul Grave, where some of the material we're talking about today has earlier aspects of it have uh, appeared. In fact, today is part of a longer project. It's not a book project yet. It will be eventually. But um, if anyone would like a transcript of the slight of the longer, more substantiated version of the, some of these arguments, please uh, email me. I'll, my email. Uh, I'll put it in the chat later. I'm speaking from Niagara, Ontario, Canada, uh, on the traditional territory of, of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. Um, I've drawn on many sources for this presentation on geoartistry today, all of which I'll, I'll reference, of course, but I've also ins been inspired to engage in inquiry and speculation from a lot of other current uh, contemporary critical, theoretical, and creative forms of writing and practice that I don't specifically reference in here, but I'm very grateful for these intensities and stimulations, and this would include the work of Robin Wall Kimmerer, Rosie Bredotti, Jeffrey Cohen, Sherry Nicholson, and many, many others. 
Um, for the purposes though today, uh, given my desire to return to some particularly influential philosophical sources, I'm just gonna put a bit of an image up for us here. Um, influential in no small part because of the conceptual precision available in their Spinozist ontogenetic project. I'll be drawing on a few passages from Deleuze and Guattari who note in A Thousand Plateaus that not only does art not wait for human beings to begin, but we may ask if art ever appears among human beings except under artificial and belated conditions. So um, I always like to know, let people know where we're going, how long it's gonna take. Um, I have a, I've, somewhere between 32 and 33 minutes moving forward. If it's a little bit longer, apologies. I'm just working on no taking multi-clausal sentences and reading them as if I were, you know, um, a middle management kind of uh, politician or something. So everything sort of lands. So to begin with uh, more broadly, when we describe a landscape, an insect, a flower as beautiful, such statements usually carry with them in the majoritarian culture in the economic north, at least, the understanding that the entities in question bear a quote unquote natural beauty unmarked by human intention and are therefore not typically understood to embody artistic quote unquote types of beauty. Deleuze and Guattari, however, invite an exploration of the artistic capacities of other than human entities when they suggest in their collaboration, A Thousand Plateaus, that Massayan is right in saying that many birds are not only virtuosos, but actually artists, given these avians demonstrated capacity for activities such as the expression of varying territorial songs or the construction of complex dwellings. Deleuze and Guattari assert that central to this other than human artistic expression is an understanding that the world is constituted by ontogenetic, and self-producing systems, rather than by traditional identitarian formations issuing forth from transcendent evaluative image lineages. They suggest instead that a distributed autonomy of expression is a key element of such processes, as well as being central to the capacity for other than human artistic expression, not anchored in traditional notions of human agency or intentionality. I'm interested in taking their, their suggestion further here today and in speculating not just on the capacity of other than human entities to express artistry, but also the ability for other than human entities to experience artistic production, to have aesthetic experiences according to the range of capacities for, for perception and expression afforded them by the assemblages of which they are constituted. This can perhaps allow us to think about how such an awareness could serve as a significant aspect of humans' ability to imagine and negotiate pathways towards post-anthropocentric futures. In a section of the Thousand Plateaus entitled 1837 of the refrain, Deleuze and Guattari discuss the emergence of artistic activity proper from the work of territoriality undertaken by various bodies operating via various ethical encounters. Their machinic articulation of the unfolding of complex relationships of assemblages is a refinement and extension of elements of Deleuze's earlier work on Spinoza. In their discussion of the refrain, or in French, la ritournelle, Deleuze and Guattari describe how the music, the use of music, or any other form of expression can create quote, a circle around an uncertain, fragile center, a temporospatial perimeter that constructs a discernible, discernible location distinct from the relative chaos that surrounds it. The borders of these locations are selectively porous in that they continuously reintroduce the potentiality of chaos, but on their own terms. In other words, Inviting chaos rather than being subject to it opens one uh, opens one open one opens the circle not on the side where the old forces of chaos press against it, but in another region, one created by the circle itself. 
This opening of the body for encounters with affections that surround it is an exercise of seeking to activate the potentialities by which it, it is encircled. And bringing us to this quotation here. This circle that's created. As though the circle tended on its own to open onto a future as a function of the working forces it shelters. This time, in order to join with the forces of the future, cosmic forces, one launches forth hazards and improvisation, but to improvise is to join with the world to join with it. The role of this refrain is, Deleuze and Guattari indicate, essentially territorial. Bird songs, they say, the bird seeks first to mark its territory. These territorial assemblages, however, are ones that are clearly open to their own deterritorialization and evolution. They do this via the improvised capacity for expansive inclusion of elements outside, initially contained by the portion of the process of the refrain that circumscribes this spatio-temporal parameters of chaos, terrestrial forces, cosmic forces. They describe these as milieus, blocks of space-time, constituted by the territorializing act of the refrain. These milieus pass into one another, opening them to chaos and potentials for change due to the rhythmic states that exist in the transition between these milieus. Milieus then become actual territories when milieu components cease to be directional, becoming dimensional instead, when they cease to become functional and, key to our work today, they become expressive. Deleuze and Guattari counter Lawrence's claim that aggression is the only basis for territory, suggesting that while aggression is a manifestation of territoriality, it cannot solely explain the work of territorialization itself, and that its source must be sought elsewhere, precisely in the becoming expressive of rhythm or melody, in the emergence of proper qualities, they say, color, odor, sound, silhouette. Deleuze and Guattari ask, can this becoming this emergence be called art. A question which if answered affirmatively would make the territory a result of art, with such a property being fundamentally artistic because art is fundamentally a poster, a placard. From this, they derive the insight that what is called art brut, art brut, is not at all pathological or primitive. It is merely this constitution, this freeing of matters, of matters of expression in the movement, as they describe it, of territoriality, the base or ground of art. The implications here are significant, they suggest, as, quote, from this standpoint, art is not the privilege of human beings. It pre-exists human expression. A further and essential step occurs, they argue, when the post or placard the signature of the becoming expression through the process of territorialization is transformed when territorializations are no longer a signature, but launched to the level of style. This moment takes uh, place when the expressive qualities entertain variable or constant relations with one another. This is what matters of expression do, they suggest. In other words, the expressive qualities no longer constitute placards that mark a territory, but instead, moving again towards the artistic, mark motifs and counterpoints that express relations of the territory to interior impulses or exterior circumstances. According to Deleuze and Patari's ontogenetic model, it is clear then that all phenomena are creative and as such engaged with a kind of artistry that produces the art brut, the art brut, of territorial expression. However, a distinction can and in fact must be made, they suggest, namely that, quote, what objectively distinguishes a musician bird from a non-musician bird is precisely this aptitude for motifs and counterpoints. That the bird song is no longer a signature, but a style. These qualities, regardless of if they are variable or even when they are constant, serve to make matters of expression something more than a poster, a placard, a mark of territory. With these new variations, 
the bird becomes style since they articulate rhythm and harmonize melody. The relationship these dynamics entertain with discourses of ethico aesthetics in Guattari's later writing are clear in the use of Spinozan language to describe the bird's relationalities with the world around it. We can say they suggest that the musician bird goes from sadness to joy, or that it greets the rising sun or endangers itself in order to sing or sings better than another. They are quick to assert, none of these formulations carry the slightest risk of anthropomorphism or implies the slightest interpretation from a human perspective. Instead, they suggest that what's going on here is a kind of geomorphism, a modulation of relationalities between a wide range of bodies at work in such instances. Key then to the artistic quality of such encounters and interrelationships is the emergence of novel and original expression generated by the interplay of components interacting via a complex non-binary dialecticism. The relation to joy and sadness, the sun, danger, perfection, they say, is given in the motif and the counterpoint, even if the term of each of these relations is not given. In the motif and the counterpoint, the sun, joy, or sadness, danger, they suggest become sonorous, rhythmic, melodic, not simply a signature, but a style. Deleuze and Guattari describe these complex interrelationships born from exercises of territoria, territoriality and emerging further through more differentiated counterpoints, motif, melody. They describe this as a machinic opera, one that is machinic because of, quote, this synthesis of heterogeneities as such that binds together orders, species, and heterogeneous qualities into an expressed machinic statement or collective moment of enunciation. They provide a recurring example of the stage maker bird that combines a variety of different registers of expression to generate sounds, movements, and colors in expressive collaboration with other aspects of the machinic assemblage surrounding it that produce, they suggest, a consolidation that consists in species-specific sounds, sounds of other species, leaf hue, throat color the stage maker bird's machinic statement or assemblage of enunciation that has become style, not simply a signature. Again, essential to the argument is the understanding that this notion of the assemblage of enunciation, the refrain and its forces of territorialization, counterpoint expression and style work through the stage maker rather than the bird being the autonomous source of the expression. The animal, they suggest, is prey to musical rhythms and melodic rhythmic schemes, explainable neither as the encoding of a recorded phonograph disc or by the movements of performance that effectuate them and adapt them to circumstances. Something that is pre-individuated is expressive through the distributed expression of the assemblage of the bird to create this moment of artistry, of style. They assert that the opposite is even true, namely that the melodic of rhythmic themes precede their performance and recording. In fact, it is any animals, humans or otherwise, capacity to move what is innate from what is innate in combination with the rest of the machinic assemblage with which it intersects. Stretching from processes in the intra-assemblage within the individuated animal body, from this point inside the individuated animal body, these intra-assemblage components, all and reaching all the way to the gates of the cosmos in their language. In other words, these creative and artistic forms of expression open out onto the affective and perceptive dynamics, not only constitutive of the socius, what we might call these inter-assemblages of courtship and gregariousness in animal or bird expressions case, but to those wider intra assemblages that constitute the nature of ontogenetic production at its widest possible scale. So they're very interested in here at these other than human, other than bird forces that precede an individuation, precede the identitarian, and work through these various milieus 
to connect to the intra-assemblage of the individuated bird out into the broader expansive inter-assemblage of the socius of the bird and the cosmos more widely, this widest possible scale. The simultaneously territorializing and expressive nature of the stage maker bird's song run through as it is by the rhythmic transitionality central to this notion of the refrain, expose the drive of the autonomous expression gathered in the assemblage. Namely, as Deleuze and Guattari will describe it in a key element of the artistic function later in their text, What is Philosophy? As being this drive to create the finite that restores the infinite. The connection between the momentary expression and the broader cosmic unfolding. An aspect of thinking here has to be the need to articulate as best as possible, considering the interspecies or interentity ventriloquism that humans such as me writing about other than human animals necessarily involves. A key element of the thinking needs to be the experience of geoartistry in and of itself from the perspective of other than human entities at hand and how the experience may be joyful for them in the sense that the entity's potentials are expanded in the Spinozan sense from the experience. This can serve to provide different examples than Deleuze and Guattari, who tend to focus on the other than human animal in their thinking about examples of autonomous expression of the artistic style that opens out onto territory, socius, and cosmos. How would one, for example, go about describing plant expression as artistic? In 1973, Dorothy Retelak published a book entitled The Sound and Music of Plants, outlining her experiments of how music affects plants that appear to demonstrate a strong relationship between types of music, volume, and plant growth. Perhaps reflecting Retelak's own unconscious predisposition to a certain type of musical conservatism, plants exposed to quote unquote soothing music thrive. Those exposed to the generally discordant and atonal music of modernist Schoenberg and Verburn failed to thrive, while plants subjected to Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix died. More recent research by Kreef and Schwartz has suggested that sound vibrations directly affect biologic living systems. And in a literature review by Chadri and Gupta, they summarize a wide range of global research stating that specific audio frequencies in the form of music facilitated by the germination and growth of plants, irrespective of their, of their music genres, shows these relational affects. The Danimar group has, become, has been working since the 1970s to find ways of translating the subtle shifts in electromagnetic patterns in plant leaves and roots into music audible for humans and currently promote a musical instrument digital interface, a MIDI instrument, that amplifies such biosignals into musical conversations between plants that appear to increase their vitality and growth. Switching to the language of Deleuze and Guattari's discussion of the refrain, how does the plant experience its interactions within its own territorialized intra-assemblage, that which is occurring within the individuated form recognized as the plant? and the wider between this interior form and the wider multiple inter assemblages of which the plant is part. From the initial perspective of the plant as a body that announces its territoriality, the xylem and phloem vessels, and the tubes of the stem serve to circulate water and nutrients extracted by root systems and the photosynthetic processes of the leaves in order to sustain the coherence of the plant's intra assemblage. The fragrance and color of the plant flower, generated in a complex relationship between the pistils, stamens, sepals, and petals, guarantees the plant's reproductive continuance from a simple, quote unquote, biological perspective. The flower and its function is the main placard, signaling an invitation to pollinators and other inter assemblage factors and collaborators, is the base or ground of art, Deleuze Guattari's language, in its constitution. It's freeing of matters of expression in the movement of territoriality. So grafting this previous argument onto the plant question, following Deleuze and Guattari's progression then, is it possible to suggest that there is an opportunity in the extended refrain of the territoriality of the plants signaling 
for a shift from expressive signature to artistic style? There are at least two ways of proceeding to answer this question. The first involves understanding that the examples of other than human animals that have artistic capacities have such capacities as a result of organismic complexity. In the case of the stage maker bird, for example, such complexity permits them to inhabit spatio-temporality in a way that affords the type of contrapuntal and improvis improvisatory interventions that Deleuze and Guattari suggest elevates signature to style, creative, creativity to artistry. Birds move quickly, have more complex neuronal pathways, and thus are more liable to have the capacities for articulating creativities beyond the art brute phase of expressive territoriality. It might then seem to follow that it is more likely that the intra assemblages of birds, these collective assemblages of enunciation that we call birds, can harness the autonomous capacity for expression, this distributed capacity that pre exists all individuated forms so as to be able to express style more, more adequately or more quickly than plants can. Despite their inherent organismic complexities, plants may be more likely, at least from a human philosophical perspective that privileges individuated expression, need the collaboration of inter-assemblage arrangements, other collaborators in, their milieu, in other milieu, to reach the dynamics of counterpoint and deterritorialization of motif understood to allow this progress from signature to style, from creativity to artistry. But is not this privileging of individuated expression with all of its anthropocentric echoes of human agency and autonomy, particularly limited from a machinic post-anthropocentric perspective that foregrounds, as these theorists are attempting to foreground, distributed expression? Indeed, would it not follow that from the perspective of distributed machinism, geo-artistry and its more complex manifestations of style is in fact liable to occur in the plant's relationship with water, light, soils, wind, geological, macro-meteorological, and other factors over a much more extended period of time? Following this logic, might we assert that in less quote unquote complex organisms, such as plants compared to birds or humans, autonomy of expression generates geo artistry in the accumulated complexity of the broader inter assemblages over months, seasons, and millennia, rather than in the individuated quote unquote behavior of the stage maker bird, more intelligible within an anthropological, ethological register. We have more of a capacity to understand individuated expression from creatures that might seem to be a bit more like us. But if we move beyond that perspective of individuation to distributed expression in these interassemblages, can we also begin to think of that as artistic over time and space expanses? The body of the meadow, the watershed, the hemisphere, the earth serves as the context for the concatenation of signatures from a range of smaller bodies contained within these larger inter-assemblages. Dynamic counterpoint, motif, these central elements of Deleuze and Guattari's understanding of the progression from signature to style, between the plant and clouds generated by orographic precipitation from humidity rising up a mountainside, contributes to the particular distributed expression of the ecosystem on a mountainside. As additional macro factors such as tectonic plates, volcanic eruptions, carbon emissions intervening the amount of light and precipitation on the mountainside, the plant responds by improvising over multiple iterations and generations of itself to find distributed and different expressions in order to move through and meet the trauma and challenge of its own tribulations in a changing world. As such, the wider inter-assemblage is the main vehicle inviting the reintroduction of potentiality of chaos into the spatio-temporal perimeter of the inter-assemblage, right? This key logic that Deleuze and Guattari articulate as being integral to this notion of the refrain. If it were possible to view these processes in an accelerated fashion, the capacity for autonomous expression 
harnessed by the aggregate complexity of the interassemblage of the mountainside might start to look from a human perceptual perspective more like a style than simply a signature. If then organismic complexity is key to the capacity for counterpoint and improvisation that marks a shift from the avbrut signature of the territorial expression to the style associated with what we understand more frequently to be human artistic expression. And also if complexity can be understood to intensify via the passing of time and the expansion of the scope of all of these interassemblages, then geo-artistry, even in its most complex forms, can be understood to inherit in every aspect of the natural world. So let's imagine a simple reductive equation. Time, or indeed the ability for simultaneous multiple responses of and in velocity, multiple temporalities. So multiple temporalities plus breadth of interassemblage, this complexity of inter and, and intra assemblage. Together, these increase the extensive possibility of de-artistry inherent in intensive potentials of an imminent and machinic universe. It is thus that with reference to the quote earlier that notes, not only does art not wait for the human begins to begin, it is not only in other than human animals that artistic precedence can be traced, but in all phenomena on the earth. The planet as expression of geo-artistry in and of which human artistic activity is a particular and singular, of course, but not monolithically exclusive or, or proprietary extension and expression. The planet as assemblage experiences Spinoza's joy in its unfolding expression. A second and complementary way of looking at the question is the plant engaging in artistic creation is to imagine the experience of the plant as well as of the inter assemblages of which it is part. And in so doing, explore the question of epico aesthetics, that work that Guattari does later in his career, as it pertains to the experience of the plant and of the wider inter assemblage itself, or indeed themselves rather than itself, if we're attempting to think in terms of multiplicity here. This experience, this constitutes the difficult speculative part of the argument where thought, as Claire Colebrook has recently written about the philosophy in the Anthropocene, thought finds itself through a constant process of self erasure. Let me return then to the language of Deleuze and Guattari that they use in what is philosophy, their last uh, collective text, collaborative text, to speak to the experience of what artists do, what art is, and how art affects and explore to what extent it can be traced to the other than human assemblages and inter assemblages from which creative expression and creative reception is always already emergent. As I suggested above, they note that art rests something from the perceptions and affections, the extraction and curation of particular durations of elements of what artists perceive in the world. This is the argument in what is philosophy. They describe these extracted elements as percepts and affects that are bundled together via the media, via media an artist is using, paint, words, movement, in a fashion that is durational, that lasts. In a clear indication of the extra human nature of the sources of the artistic, affects are described as the non-human becomings of the human. Given the work of art's capacity to sustain and generate the associated perceptions and affections in those encountering the artistic expression, Deleuze and Guattari use the word monument to describe the work of art. Although not monumentality is defined by its fixity and finitude, instead the monument of the work of art is determined by its capacity to continue via the block of sensations that these bundled percepts and affects to create the finite that restores the infinite. It lays out a composition that in turn to the creation of the aesthetic figure bears monuments or composite sensations. Central then to the post anthropocentric understanding of art then is to be able to at the very least to speculate and imagine the experience of the other than human entity's relationship to what might be called the, the monumental from their perspective. So vectoring into the last couple of pages, folks. Thanks so much for your patience. 
Um, and I'm just going to give uh, an example from uh, something that occurred in, in, in my backyard. Uh, and then I, it's a page or two, and then I have a concluding paragraph or two. Um, so how do we, how do we work through this? An impure and impure critical and philosophical approach fused with speculative prose is one method for kind of trying to work through this. For example, I live in a small acreage surrounding by fields and forests in the, in the, in the country, in the Niagara region of Southwestern Ontario. Every year towards mid-June, fireflies, beetles of the Lampridae family of the Coleoptera order, generating bioluminescence by a sacs of fluid in their abdomen, appear at dusk and into the evening in the forests and fields on and around this piece of land my, where my house is. The biologically established reasons for this bioluminescence are largely that it represents an evolutionarily differentiated tactic for attracting mates, or indeed for attracting other insects to prey on. From a geo-artistic perspective, the art brute, the art brut, expressed by the insect's territorialization is a signature, a placard of the insect's presence. From the insect's perspective, what, what can we imagine their relationship might be with the perceptual and affect realities of the experience of flying about, communicating with each other for various reasons via this light? And what of the inter-assemblage realities of the other insects, plants, and bats' perceptual and affective re realities in the face of the, of the Lampridae? Is the possibility of style inherent here? <clears throat> One evening a number of summers ago, a new moon appeared from behind large cumulonimbus clouds over a field, over the field at back shortly after dusk. The flight patterns of the insects changed as their velocity increased, as well as their height off the ground. With a seeming shift uh, in response to the moon from more randomized patterns of flight and insect arrangement in above the field to more uniform vertical ascent and descent of flight that rose to 20 feet above the ground and then back down again. The moon disappeared behind a cloud and after about 10 minutes, the flight pattern shared by about 50% of the hundreds of fireflies that could proceed they then return to the lower flying and more randomized pattern of flight. After 20 minutes, the moon reappeared behind the clouds, this time somewhat higher in the sky. And again, after about 10 minutes, over half the insects in the field had regained the elevated flight pattern with the vertical ascent and descent. After about 30 minutes of this, small clusters of 10 or 15 insects congregated in eight or nine spots throughout the field and began blinking on and off in largely shared patterns. This ball formation. The patterns of bioluminescence was not homogeneous within each group or uniform across the groups. But again, at least half of the insects in each of these small clusters would every minute or two activate and deactivate the bioluminescence simultaneously every three or four seconds. The experience of watching this was of a gradual gathering coherence of the pulsing of the insects across my field of view. Again, this activity described from a behaviorist perspective might include reference to rhythmical entrainment of bioluminescence for purposes of reducing exposure to predation, or indeed heightened flight patterns giving increased visibility for the insects across the light spectrum, permitting more extended departures from safer confines in the long grass. These or other similar reasons might well be part of the overall reality of the insect's experience in the moment. But what of the inter-assemblage relationalities between the insects and the curiously bright echoing of their bioluminescence by the moon that could serve as an invitation to an intensified experiential sensibility among the insects. Might this invitation and the shift of movement it seemed to invoke be one among a number of affections induced by the perceptions generated by the inter-assemblage counterpoint of firefly moon? As suggested above and earlier, we might not be able to assert that the complexity of either of the organisms, firefly moon, has the capacity to engender the reflexivity necessary to create art with the self-consciousness, even if it is informed by energies beyond consciousness, usually understood to be necessary for human artistic work. Nonetheless, is there something about the time plus scope of inter-assemblage arrangement that extracts for these insects, if not for the moon, an experience of monumentality, 
of elevated intensity and extensity, leaving percept and affect together, combined in sufficiently indelible form to induce this monumentality of this kind every time a moon rises on a certain occasion above a field of fireflies. Is there a joy of the fireflies, or rather the complex interassemblage of fields, moon, fireflies, cloud, wind, grass, tree, and then all of the various striations and levels of human engagement with this landscape, a genocidal landscape, a settler, colonial, invader landscape in these encounters? How is this tied together? So just concluding now for, for half a page. Regardless of the remaining amount of unthought terrain, perhaps what is clear from these speculations is that ultimately it behooves those humans attempting to move beyond the anthropocentric histories of reductive materializations to articulate the ways in which other than human entities might experience creative and artistic phenomena, given that these can be central to each entity's expansion or contraction of abilities and potential of their capacity in this Spinozan sense, taken up by so many thinkers at the moment, of joy. In other words, understanding with nuance the experiences of beauty generated and taken up by other than human entities can help humans attempt to understand these entities' value on their own terms. This is most especially significant at a time when, in a perhaps valiant but ultimately misguided many green economists are financializing every natural process as a means of defending it. We have to save the bees because they contribute so many billions of dollars to the economy. We need to save the wetlands because they filter massive amounts of water. And this would otherwise cost us billions to do. In a time when such strategies, ones that are a reductive manifestation of the numerations and objectifications that have led, themselves led this epistemology of reductivism, has led to the deleterious planetary effects of the Anthropocene in the first place, all this extractivism, capitalist extractivism. Even as these, such as the green economists' attempts are being undertaken as a last ditch effort to preserve natural systems from human encroachment and destruction, continuing to find ways to describe other than human entities' qualities and capacities for artistic expression and reception would seem to be an important part of the collective and deeply political work of imagining ways in which other than human bodies can be conceived of as having value outside of economic and reductive extractive pathways. So finishing with a bit of manifesto, thank you so much for listening. I will stop the screen share here. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, David. It was fantastic.